Hello everyone, my name is Raymond, I'm the minister here at St John's Church in Lurgan and we're so glad you can join us. Whether you're a regular or newcomer or even a visitor, it's great you could join us as we come to worship together in this way. But just one or two things to bring to your attention before we begin. And the first is that our register of general vestry members is now open. And registering and becoming a, a, a member of our general vestry means you can take a more active role in the church. And so if you're interested in registering, you need to be over the age of 18. You need to give to the church in a recordable manner, whether that's through free will offering envelopes or through a standing order or, or, or in some way. But uh, the third thing is that you need to call St. John's your church home. And so if you're interested in registering, please do contact me either by, by email raymond at stjohnslurgan.org or contacting me on 028 3832 for more information. The second thing is that uh, every three years it's required that those who have any uh, current role or are thinking about uh, having a role in our, any of our children's ministries and the need to go through our uh, child protection training which is, our, which is our safeguarding trust training. And so if you've done that at any point within the last three years then you're okay but if you haven't done it or it's been more than three years since you've done it then you need to uh, uh, either uh, get trained in it or to update your training and the diocese is, is running that on Zoom, which is happening on Thursday, the 11th of February, from half past seven. And again, if you're interested in being part of that, please do get in touch with me and I'll send you the Zoom details for that. And so as we come to worship God today, I want to open with some verses from Psalm 72, which says, Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness, May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish, and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy, and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvellous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and Amen. You know, this Psalm, Psalm 72 comes as kind of the desperate cry or the desperate prayer of a desperate person. You know, they say or they feel that they have no one who can help. You know, it's a cry to this king, this person, for them to come and to rule and reign, which brings about justice and hope. And when this king comes, when this king is present, it's, you know, it'll bless the people who will then bless others. It'll be a blessing to all of the nations. And why at the time when this was written in the Old Testament, there wasn't a king that was able to answer that prayer? We know from the New Testament that Jesus is the king that does answer that prayer. And so as we come to worship together today, let's praise God for his just, eternal, unbounded rule and eternal reign. Because our hope is this, that God is not only powerful enough to help you, but he also loves you enough to do so. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, how great and glorious is your name above all others. How great is the hope that you give that's above all else. 
and how great is your love for us that is so beyond all else. For we are precious in your sight. So as we come to worship you, we pray that you would fill us again with your hope and with your joy. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. today is from Mark chapter 1 verses 35 through 45. Very early in the morning while it was still dark Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him and when they found him they explained everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So let's pray. Lord, I pray that the words of my lips and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts would now and always be acceptable in your your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. 
Amen. And so we're continuing our series through Mark's Gospel, looking at the real Jesus. And we've seen how Mark opened his Gospel right in chapter 1, verse 1, with the words, The beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. In other words, Mark introduces Jesus as God's Son, the Messiah, which means his anointed King. And then a bit further on in verse 15 of that first chapter, we see where Jesus' first words were, the time has come. Which could also mean that the time has now been fulfilled. In other words, Jesus saying everything that's gone before in the Old Testament, all of the hope and the longing and the promises that were made, they've now come to pass and be fulfilled in him. Do you say that now the time has come? And so he continues. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. In other words, he's saying God's rule and reign over people's lives and hearts is now being established. Jesus' kingly rule will be seen in the hearts and the lives of those who he has touched, those who he has changed and transformed. They will be seen over the different circumstances, such as last week where Jesus cast out demons and was healing people. In all these things, the kingdom of God has come near. And because this is happening, Jesus is calling people to repent, to turn away from the rebellion, the rejection of God, and instead turn towards him, turn back to him. And so within that kind of context that Jesus calls his followers, he calls his first disciples to come and to follow me, to be part of this new kingdom movement. Because the way that you knew that someone had repented and was a part of this kingdom was not that they just prayed a prayer however long ago, but it was that they had accepted the rule and reign of Jesus in their lives. It was that they were living for this king, according to kingdom principles. Which right as we begin to look at this passage together, I have to ask, is that the decision that you've made? Are you following this king? Are you part of this kingdom? Because if you're someone who says, you know, I haven't really made up my mind, I'm not really quite sure, I'm neither for Jesus and I'm not really against Jesus, that, that, that is in fact a decision as well. Because either Jesus rules and reigns in your life, or he doesn't. And so today, as we further consider Jesus, we see a day in his life. We're given kind of like a 24-hour window here. And I don't know if you've ever seen the TV programme called 24, which is centred on 24 episodes, each an hour long. And the main character is this person called Jack, and he's always trying to solve some extremely complex uh, terrorist situation. And honestly, watching through the programmes, I find it very, very hard to follow exactly what's going on. But when we look at the day in the life of Jesus, it's thankfully at least for me, very simple and easy to follow. Because in this passage we see that Jesus was a man of prayer, of word and of deed. So first is prayer. We're told right at the beginning of this passage that very early in the morning, while it's still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place and he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him. When they found him, they, expla- they, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. So up until this point, you know, Jesus has been going around teaching things. He's been going around kind of healing people, casting out demons from people. And so, so naturally, once, once the word got out, people are excited. They can, everyone wants a piece of Jesus at this point. Everyone's looking for him. It's a time of incredible popularity. A time of tremendous opportunity. A time of extreme busyness. Extreme productivity. Jesus getting things done. Lots of opportunities to get other things done. And yet, Jesus' reaction to that, I, I think is very, very different to the reaction I think that you or I would have. Because here, 
If we were in the shoes of Jesus at a time of unbelievable uh, uh, opportunity and popularity to get stuff done, the first thing that would go for us, if it's there at all, would be quiet time and prayer. It would just get squeezed out. It'd be gone. There'd be no time for it. But Jesus, on the other hand, the busier he gets, the more he prays. The busier he gets, the more he prays, which shows us the priority of prayer in Jesus' life. Because we're told that while it was early in the morning, Jesus got up, he went off on his own, he found a solitary place, in other, in other words, a place where there was no one else around, and he prayed. And so by the time that his disciples then got up, noticed that Jesus wasn't around, had to go and look for him and find him because it's unlikely that they knew exactly where it was. And by the time they find him, it's, it, it, it's likely that, that, that at least a couple of hours has passed. Jesus has been praying for a couple of hours. And so when you and I come into one of these times of productivity, where we have all these opportunities and we're so busy, what is it that we're really accomplishing? Maybe we're making more money, which is a good thing. Maybe we're also helping people, which is also a good thing. But here's Jesus standing in the middle of an opportunity that was about to literally change the world forever. And yet he still thought that prayer is far too important to just let it be squeezed out. And so if Jesus increases his prayer as he increases in busyness, why do we so often think that we can do without it? Why do we so often fall into this kind of pattern and thinking, you know, prayer's a good thing if I have time for it, but if I don't, it'll be okay. I'll get back to it sometime. You know, why? because why we're not told the content of what Jesus prays, we're not told exactly, or any information about what exactly Jesus is praying here, but all you have to do is stand back a bit and look at the other instances where Jesus was praying to see why he has it as so important. Because when you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, towards the end of Mark's Gospel in chapter 14, what's the first words out of Jesus' mouth? It's, Father. When Jesus' disciples come to him and ask, and to ask him to teach them how to pray, how does he begin? Again, it's, Father. You see, the fundamental thing about prayer is that it's not about give us our daily stuff. That's not how Jesus begins prayer. That doesn't come first, does it? Nor is it about forgive us our wrongdoing. As important as that is, but that doesn't come first either. The essence of prayer for the Christian is that in Jesus, the creator and the Lord of the universe has become our father. That's the thing on which prayer and everything else is based on. You know, as uh, a minister, one of the things that I've had a lot of involvement in is funerals. And in talking to different families, I can't tell you how many times that some of them have said things like, you know, what I wouldn't give just to be able to hear my mom's, my dad's voice again. Just to be able to speak to them, just to be able to, to hear them. Because when it comes down to it, what we really crave is not just more stuff, but basking in the love and the presence of those that cherish us. And at the heart of prayer, that, that's what Jesus is getting at. That's what he's drilling down into. Because earlier on in this chapter, at his baptism, the Father speaks to Jesus and says, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And it's that that Jesus keeps going back to in prayer. Because the engine, the driving force of Jesus' life was the joy of his sonship. The delight of his sonship. And that's why he goes back to it every day. It's what gives Jesus the joy to, to keep doing his ministry. It also gives him the purpose of his ministry. Which is to create people who have the same fatherly relationship with God as the son has. In other words, to create sons and daughters of God. And so what that means is that when you come to God in prayer, you're not just talking to an impersonal force. 
You're not talking to God who is your boss, but you're talking to God who is your father that loves you. You're talking to your father. And so I'm sure that there are some of you that are listening to this and you're isolated. You're in lockdown. I'm also sure that there are others of you who are stressed. You're, you're homeschooling. You, you're, at the end, you're at the end of your rope. You know, here's the joy that will get you through. Spending time with your father that loves you. And if you need help with prayer, we have a WhatsApp prayer group that runs every Tuesday evening. So get in touch. Bit of a shameless plug, but, but we need to spend more time in prayer. We need to spend more time in prayer. We can't do without it. So first is prayer, but second then is word. When Simon Peter comes looking for Jesus, because everyone else seems to be looking for him, you know, the people were looking for Jesus to work more miracles. And so the people are looking for Jesus because they know, Jesus, we have something here for you to do. But what's Jesus' response? Jesus says, verse 38, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so the people had something that they wanted Jesus to do. But Jesus' response is, no, I have something to do that you don't know. I have something to do that you, that, that you don't seem to realise is important. Which is that I've not just come to do things, but I've also come to preach. That's the ministry of the word. But why do I say that's something they didn't know about? Well, when you talk to almost anyone about what could Jesus do for them, almost everyone would say, well, Jesus could heal me, or Jesus could give me joy, or he could give me something, or he could do something for me. You know, there'd be almost no one would say, well, I think Jesus could teach me something, but Jesus has something to say to me. After all, even, even, and I don't know how many churches have heard this in, but how often have you heard the quote, from St Francis of Assisi that says, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. How many times have you heard people quote that? You know, and that quote itself is even um, disputed and widely thought to be false because St Francis was known to even preach the gospel to all of creation, even to wild animals. But in this passage, when Jesus says that he has other places to go, What he's saying is that he didn't just come to feed the hungry and to heal the sick. Because what he came to do isn't just to take care of your body, but also to take care of your soul. To take care of your soul. Let me put it this way. Have you ever done something where someone else goes, why did you do that? And and, and you reply, well, isn't it obvious? And they reply, what am I, a mind reader? It's the same with the gospel. People will not know who Jesus is, why he's come, and why he matters, simply just by seeing miracles. As wonderful as those things are, they need preaching. Because there is no gospel. There is no gospel without words. We need to have words. We need to proclaim. We need to be preaching and teaching about the gospel. And so Jesus was a man of words. A man of prayer. And lastly, he was a man of deeds. We're told that in verses 40 to 42. That a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. To be a leper meant that you had a skin disease. You know, it wasn't wasn't an easy skin disease. To have it basically meant that you lost the feeling, the nerve endings in your fingers, in your hands, throughout your body, slowly begun to die. But socially, you were seen as untouchable. You know, lepers had to live outside the city boundaries for fear of infecting 
someone else. And if they even saw anyone coming towards them, even from a far off distance, they had to either ring a bell or shout out, unclean, unclean. Because people saw leprosy as a punishment from God that was contagious. And so they were also excluded from worship. They couldn't enter into the synagogue or into the temple or anything like that. And so when this leper sees Jesus, he knows that what he needs is not just to be made well, but to be made clean. And Jesus does so by reaching out to touch him. Jesus reaches out to touch him. Why does Jesus touch a leper? Because he needs to. Well, we see in other places, even as we've seen so far, Jesus can heal people just by thinking, by a thought, or by a word, by speaking. And so it's not that Jesus needed to touch him, but Jesus touched him out of love. He's doing it out of love. Because he's touching a man who is so starved for love. And by reaching out and touching him, he's saying, I'm with you. He reaches out and touches him and says, well, how do you like that? Because the motivation is mentioned right there. It says in the passage that Jesus was indignant. And the word indignant means is to be angered by the unfair treatment of someone. In other words, it's saying Jesus was moved to the depths of his being by compassion for this man. Which is why Jesus does what he does. Because if you love someone, if you care about someone, then you meet all of the needs that you see. You don't just sit around and have kind of debates and conversations about when is evangelism more important than social justice or social justice more important than evangelism. You just meet all of the needs that you see. You care for the body and you care for the soul. If you see a person that has needs, you meet them all because of love. That's what Jesus does. So what does that mean for us? Well, the personal application in this passage is the scandalous interaction between Jesus and this leper. Because when the leper comes to Jesus and says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You know, notice he's not demanding Jesus. He says, he doesn't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, you have to make me clean. Jesus, you should make me clean. Jesus, what, why was I ever a leper to begin with? He comes to Jesus and unconditionally, without attaching any kind of conditions, places himself into Jesus' hands. You know, he just says, Jesus, I'm here at your feet. Jesus, do with me what you will. He just comes to him unconditionally and offers himself to Jesus. You know, and if you do that today, you'll be seen as a leper. I mean, we live in an age where even keeping a commitment to a gym membership is, is, is seen to be a hard thing, let alone keeping any commitment to Jesus. But are you willing to be a leper? Are you willing to be someone who is totally committed and dependent upon Jesus? Because the thing that will utterly change your life is seeing the scandal of Jesus' unconditional love in touching this leper. Because the thing about religion is that it says that you always have to work very, very hard in order to remain pure and it's then that you'll get into heaven. It's then that you'll have God in your life. And so that invariably means that you have to stay away from tainted people. You have to ta stay away from people who are seen as stained, people who are seen to be unclean. Because up, up until this point in history, what happened is that when a clean and an unclean person came into contact, then the clean person was made unclean. But here, when the clean and the unclean come together, we're told in verses 43 and 44 that Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. So Jesus, after touching this leper, tells him to go to the priest, offer the sacrifices, because the priests were kind of like the, the, the health officers of their day. And he could have seen that the man was no longer a leper and could then be allowed to enter back into the community, back into society. But note was that Jesus doesn't have to do it. And Jesus has touched the leper. That, that would have seen uh, as something that, you know, that Jesus is now unclean. Jesus under normal 
conditions and regulations would have had to go through all of the ceremonial washing that the leper did. But he doesn't. Because for the first time ever, the clean and the unclean have come together. And it's not that the clean became unclean, but the unclean became clean. For the first time, clean and unclean came together. And the unclean became clean. Try saying that three times fast. But, <laughs> but by not going to the priest, what Jesus is doing, he's saying, I am cleanliness itself. It doesn't matter how unclean you are. It doesn't matter how bad you are or how bad that you think you are. It doesn't matter what's been done to you or how ashamed you are. If you come into contact, if you come into connection with Jesus, you're clean. You are totally clean. Because it is Jesus that fits you for the presence of God. And how can he make that claim? Well, at the very end of the passage, Jesus tells the leper to go to, go to the priest, but not to tell anyone what's happened. But it says in verse 45, instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. You know, the man does exactly the opposite of what Jesus tells him to do, which is a wonderful example to us all. You know, the leper disobeys what Jesus tells him to do. And as a result, the leper and Jesus, in fact, exchange places. Because when the leper is disobedient, the leper who used to have to live in lonely places is welcomed and incorporated back into the city and into the community. And Jesus, who used to live in the community and in the city, has to, in fact, now go out and live in lonely places. And what we have here is just a small picture, in fact, of what happens at the end of Jesus' life, where he is crucified outside the city. He's crucified outside the gate. Jesus, Jesus is the one who becomes the outcast. He becomes the unclean. He is excluded so that we could be included. He who had no sin became sin for us so that we might in him become the righteousness of God. And this is the answer to everything. Do you want, the, do you want to have the kind of prayer life that he had? Because you can know that God is your father and not just your boss because of what Jesus has done for you. And if you want to have the kind of ministry of word and deed that is love driven, then this is what will, will fill you with compassion. Because when Jesus, or when, when Peter spoke in verse 37, everyone is looking for you. You know, he spoke more truly than he knew. Because everyone is in fact looking for Jesus back then and everyone is still looking for Jesus today, whether they realise it or not. Because all of us, all of us deep down, are looking for that same scandalous, unconditional offer of love in our lives. But here's that offer of love for you today. Look no longer. Jesus offers you the unconditional, scandalous love today. Let's pray. Father, give us a sense of your love for us. Would you come and flood our hearts with your love? And Father, you know that some of our hearts are tired. We're a bit weary, perhaps a bit cranky. So we come to you as lepers, asking to make your love the engine of our lives as it was the engine of Jesus' life. So that our hearts are just so full of compassion for our families, for our neighbours, for our communities, that we would want to meet all the needs of those who are around us. Father, we also pray for those who are in leadership, where tensions are high, We've seen this past week where the Northern Ireland Protocol has tried to prevent vaccines entering the country. 
as well as the suspension of work in an animal and food check in Larne due to safety concerns to non-national workers. Father, we pray against fear. We pray against intimidation. We pray against anything that would see people and communities plunged into the way things were in the past. And Father, we pray that real leadership would emerge in these days. We pray that people would feel safe. They would feel content. That they would have leaders who truly care about them. And that you would give to these leaders wisdom and grace as they govern. But Father, we also bring before you those who are suffering. Those who are unwell and those who are bereaved at this time. Those who feel they are facing life without anyone to support or help them. And so we pray that they would know that they are not alone. That they are not unseen. And that their cares are not unheard. For they have a God who sees, a God who hears, a God who cares, a God who loves them. So we pray that by your spirit you would come and encourage them. You would come and fill them with your strength. Fill them with your hope. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. Amen. And as our Saviour Christ has taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Folks, we hope you've been blessed by our time together. So we're just going to bring our time to a close with a prayer of blessing. And so to God, who by the power at work within us, is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love, both this day and forevermore. Amen.